Yo, 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 what's up? What's good? It's your boy BQ with the Impact Lounge here on YouTube and on podcasting platforms. So what I say a few weeks ago that on my Air Force Reserve weekends, I wouldn't be recording a show. Uh, there would be no Cool Factor podcast definitely on those weekends. Um, and it was my reverse, my, excuse me, my reserve weekend this past weekend. And believe it or not, it is only one weekend a month. Like it, it's, I feel like uh, I'm telling you guys this almost Almost every other week <laughs> that, you know, oh, I skipped an episode because of this and this. But you know what? This week I was like, you know what? It's Tuesday. It's a little late in the week. But let me get in here. Talk a little impact. Um, you know, someone someone brought it up to me. You know, I, I know there's some people who don't like to get a review too late after the episode. I totally get that. And there was someone, you know, kind of brought it up to me. And it's not the first time I've heard this, but sometimes people were telling me, you know, people just like to hear your thoughts and opinions on the show, uh, even if it's not necessarily, you know, right after the episode or a day after. Sometimes people want to hear uh, what I'm thinking. You know, I know that the the few podcasts I listen to, whether it's wrestling or basketball or whatever the case, there's there's times where I'm watching something or I see something happen and I'm thinking, can't wait to hear what so and so has to say about this, you know, and I'm kind of taking that away from a lot of you guys uh, because I do take those weeks off. So this week I said, you know what? It's a little bit late. I did have my reserve weekend, but screw it. Let's get on here. Let's got to get on the lounge. Let's talk impact. So we're going to talk about this, uh, this past episode. I'm going to give you my, my general thoughts. The, uh, the little distribute, <laughs> I hate using the term distribution deal. Um, the distribution deal, TV deal, whatever it was, uh, I think it's pronounced days in, um, we're going to talk about on a cool factor coming up. So we wanted to both research it and, and converse and talk about it when we're together, myself and TW. So I'm not really going to touch on that tonight, but we're going to run over this episode. I did not catch throwback throwdown. I pretty much refuse to watch that. Uh, you know, I watched it the first year and I, I truly thought it was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And if you guys like the throwback throwdown, more power to you. Like, I'm not telling you, oh, you shouldn't like it or or anything like that. I'm not trying to persuade anyone not to watch it. Th my personal opinion is, is that it's bad. And they like to use the term, oh, well, it's, it's fun. We're having fun. Well, you guys don't like fun. You know, that's that's the buzzword, not the buzzword, but that's that's, I guess, for lack of a better term, the marketing word that they use is fun. Like, this is a fun show, but I don't have fun watching it. You know what I say every year is that the wrestlers appear to have more fun doing it than I think the majority of the people have fun watching it. And, uh, you know, that first year that they did it, I mean, the, the crowd was stone cold through the whole thing. You know, you could hear a pin drop in that place. It was really painful to watch but I, I think mainly it was because it wasn't really the wrestling and the goofiness it was what really turned me off about it was these long promos between matches and i mean ever like there was just so much talking um of the wrestlers trying to be in these characters and it just wasn't for me if it was a you know when they say a throw if for initially when they're like well it's a throwback show i thought it was like Okay, if it's their version of Glow or if it's their version of, you know, the territory days where you could dress up as an Indian or you could dress up as a plumber or whatever. I thought that's what they were going back to. But this, this is more of like a mockery of wrestling. This is more of a, a parody of wrestling. And that's why it doesn't work for me. If it was just like we're just pretending it's the it's the early 80s then bam, I'd probably be down with that. You know what I mean? Like, that, in, in a sense, like, that's kind of what women of wrestling is. It's an updated version of GLOW. Like, I can get with that. I, I like women of wrestling. So, it's whatever. Um, But I didn't watch it. I, I'll probably catch the Alicia match at some point when I have time. But I know that was the BTI match. Uh, she was misbehaving. What was, uh? let me let me scroll up here. What was uh, Havoc's name? Lady Bird Johnston. This was the one match that they probably could have had Alicia get away with winning. <laughs> and of course, they they chose not to go that direction. All good. Um, 
I'm going to kick this off talking about the Eric Young stuff. So I know that happened at the end of the episode. We're going to talk about that first because that's that was the most important thing on the show, in my opinion. It was It's what really stood out. We can talk Eric Young here in general a little bit, violent by design. Uh, but that's what we're going to talk about first. Uh, I thought the episode was okay. I thought it started off good and then like kind of progressively got worse as it as it went. So they can't always be amazing. You know, with Overdrive, that was probably my least favorite Impact Plus show in a I mean that I can remember because usually I really love those shows, and this this was one that that missed for me. Uh, and this episode was okay. Um, if it's good, I'm gonna say it's good. If it's bad, I'm gonna say it's bad. If it's okay, I'm gonna say it's okay. And uh, this was just okay for me. Uh, when it kicked off, uh, when it when the episode aired, and this you guys know this is something I always look for. How quickly are they going to get into the episode? I don't like fluff, and I know you guys love when I talk about AEW, but there was the episode that happened after their Full Gear pay-per-view. They managed to recap the pay-per-view, play the intro, and start the match at in a minute and five seconds. So I do think that's uh, that's very important that you know you can do your recaps, but get get into why I should watch this show as quickly as possible. You know, I really that's something I really, truly believe in with this. This episode, you know, they did the Bully Ray Josh stuff, which seems to be every, you know, the way they kick off every episode. Um, and there was no we on the night. So when you cut that out, you know, recap whatever it is, cut out the stupid song, get to why we should watch the show. So they did good. They did a good job with that this time around. And it kicked off with Bully Ray. You know what? I'm sorry. I started getting into the. <laughs> The show. I told you guys I was going to talk about Eric Young first. So let's let's fast forward to the very very end with Eric Young. So we guys we we know that Eric Young is is Audi. We know he's going to go back to WWE. And I think in general we're going to see more people leave Impact here soon. But I think in general it's going to be very difficult for Impact to sign people going forward. Uh, I, I've said that in the past. I've said that when AEW, you know, got going. I said it when Ring of Honor was kind of revived. Um, and now that NXT is going back to getting some indie guys and Triple H just re-signing people. This is, um, it's going to be very hard. This was, we had a period here where it was like the worst time in wrestling to be a free agent. And that's when, you know, AEW was super bloated. NXT was only signing you if you, uh, did gymnastics in college and knew nothing about wrestling. R you know, Ring of Honor went away. There was this like period where it was a really bad time to be a free agent. I didn't see Impact capitalize on that. You know, they brought in some guys and they they were just you know short, uh, short contracts, which we talk about it a lot. That's that's the business model that they're currently following. It's something that clearly works for them that they like doing that they feel keeps the product fresh, but the fans don't like it. I, I, I've yet to meet a fan that's that's into it. I'll, I'll put it like that. So I think there's a disconnect between the company and the fan from that standpoint. But Eric Young's supposed to go back. To do what? I don't know. There's, there's kind of some rumors he might re reform uh, Sanity. And, um, you know, we got a good... A uh, good amount of Eric Young. He signed a couple years ago. He's one of those slam anniversary surprises. We had him for a while. Uh, he was injured for a good portion of it. He did some some good things. Not not too many memorable matches. I know he had the one with Sammy, and and that's that's kind of disappointing because that feud really would have been cool and that match for like a pay per view. But I guess you know they knew he was leaving, so they kind of had to rush it. Makes sense, but that was one of the feuds that we should have got it a long time ago. And between Eric Young and Sammy Callahan both getting hurt, getting hurt, we just never got it. Um, but anyway, we know he's going back. They did a segment here. Um, of of I, 
I never totally understand what the hell they're talking about with the sickness and all that. It, it all kind of sounds like words to me. But the, him and Dina were sitting down, like just just how it started, just how Violent by, by Design started. And this was really well done. I know Meltzer said it was the worst thing he'd ever seen. He clearly hasn't seen Throwback Throwdown. But I thought this was this was well done. Whoever puts these video packages together, I don't think is the... I don't think it's the full-time crew. I don't think it's the same group who edits the show. There's, there's no way because it is, it is night and day, you know, um, even the, the song choices, you know, they played music during this and it, it, it fit, it worked. And then you have these, ma- you know, these matches like, you know, Eddie and PCO fighting in the desert to corny music. You know, it, it's, it has to be different groups of people. Just, it just has to be. Cause, cause it's really, real, really well done when they do the violent by design stuff. Um, it looks a little like what EC3 does. So I don't know if it's the same, uh, same individual or same people, but that's what it looks like. And then, you know, I thought it was done. Well, impact loves to kill people. They love to kill people off. I think it was kind of shocking the first time they did it. And, um, I don't know. I wouldn't say I hate it. But I don't know that I like it at the same time. I think what I do like about it is that it's outside the box. No one else is doing anything like that. The problem is, I do think that they feel when they do their, you know, for lack of better term, cinematic stuff, that they are trying to fill the void that Lucha Underground used to have. I feel like they, uh, when Lucha Underground went under, they said we can we can be Lucha Underground. We can do Lucha Underground stuff and incorporate it into our show. The problem is it's never been as good as what they did on Lucha Underground. And it worked on Lucha Underground just like it works in women are wrestling because it comes off as a television show and not a wrestling show. And the whole show is based in fantasy. With impact, they go back and forth between what's real and what's fantasy. So that's why this stuff kind of misses the mark for me a little bit because it's not a representation of violent by design. Once we get them in the ring, it's it's like two different, two different things. But that being said, again, I I thought it was really, really good. You know, they killed them. I don't know why they had to kill them. Uh, That's just something they do. They did to, to Ali. You know, they try to kill Johnny Bravo, trying to think whatever, what what other ones. Um, I know there was someone else that died at some point. I I can't remember. Oh, the Undead Realm stuff, you know. So it's whatever. That's how they want to write them off TV. Cool. It's going to be interesting to see what they do with Violent by Design going forward. They're, They're obviously still a stable, but they're not Eric Young stable. So. I'm guessing Diener's taking it over. I can't imagine they would be like main eventers. But I I like this version of the group better, to be honest. I know probably nine out of nine of you don't. But for me, um, because I'm such a big Angels fan, and I've talked about that before. I'm a big Con fan because I've talked about loving the early days of the Ascension. So I'm interested to see what they do as a team. I just I have a hard time believing, okay, they're gonna be holding tag team gold and all that, you know. It seems like it's probably moving closer to the jobber territory. But we'll see if that's what they do with it. Um, hopefully they follow up on it next week, though. It can't be one of those angles that you know they they do it and then the next week we don't get these guys on TV. You know, I want to see what they do, but definitely good luck to Eric Young. I don't I don't know what he expects to do over there. I don't think a lot's gonna change. As far as, you know, some of these guys go there thinking, I'm going to be a big star. And then what do they do when they get there? You know, it's not just Vince. It's a bloated roster. It's the same problem AEW has. So uh, we'll see. But they wrote them off TV. Curiously, know what you guys think about killing people to get them off TV. You know, again, to, you know, go back to what I just said. The disconnect for me is that half of the show is based in reality. And then half the show is not half the show, but. A portion of the show is based in fantasy, and that's why it doesn't like quite work for me. But it's not to say it was 
bad or anything like that. You know, I, I, I thought it was cool. It was okay. So now we're going back to the actual show. The the uh, kicks off of Bully Ray in the ring. I thought this was really good as well. Um, I just thought the show started strong, but progressively got worse and then kind of picked up again at the end. But I thought he cut a good heel promo. He got um, a reaction. And I, I talked about this back when Alberto El Patron was in the company. And I was there when he debuted. And, I, you know, I've talked about this many times, but they got the the big Tron behind him. They misspelled his name. So they had to re-edit his entrance. So you guys never saw his actual debut. And the crowd went insane. Like that place went crazy for him. And then I was around for, the, you know, he was cutting a promo. I was around the next night. And I was just so shocked how this guy could generate such a response from the audience, from the impact zone who in Orlando, who back then we were saying, oh, it's dead, you know, and he would get such a response out of them. And I think there is a, I think there's a certain talent that the wrestlers have who are used to cutting promos and having to get heat to 10,000, 15,000 people that when they come to a small smaller company like this i think they just know how to work the people and it, they just you know they're so confident in such a, a in front of such a big group they, they can get this small group of people just chanting whatever the hell so i enjoyed what he did at the beginning and the bully race stuff even though i don't think in 2023 he should be main eventing a pay-per-view and tommy dreamer should be part of this like obviously i don't really care for that but they've exceeded expectations with the storyline i think i think i i see some people there's i'm still not really feeling it uh but i think for me as a fan and as a viewer they exceeded expectations um when he's sitting here like i you know you're gonna know when i do it i'm gonna do you do it to your face and um the way he actually did it, I thought was good. And I talked about the cool on the last cool factor I did with TW. Impact has a crutch, and the crutch is bring the wife into it. That is when, you know, when we need some extra heat, get the wifey involved. And it works. It works for the most part, but it's it's definitely become a crutch that I don't think is going to work again anytime soon. If Josh wins this feud or wins this match, I should say, his next feud cannot Im involve his wife getting into it like it did with Moose. Because with, with Moose, that was a year ago. I know it doesn't feel like it, but it was damn near a year ago. Not not quite, but it was, it was close. Um, and now Bully Ray's doing it. You can't do it again. You you really really can't. I mean, look how uh, look how people stopped caring when you start factoring a list into Eddie Edwards storylines, you know, the very first one with Davey Richards and Angelina love, like that was one of the best feuds they had going on at the time. But now when you get the two of them together and it's the husband and wife, you know, there's this difference. She doesn't get attacked, but they get the, you know, they get into it. People just have no interest in that anymore because of that crutch. But the night starts off wrestling wise with rich Swan versus bully Ray. There's not a Rich Swan match that I'm not going to enjoy. You know, I mean, I absolutely love this dude. I love his matches. The sympathy he gets as a baby face. I really enjoy watching him. He's been in the company for a while. I hope he continues to be. I don't see, you know, he won't go. WWE won't take him back. And um, I mean, what would he do at AEW? He would just be a, he, he really wouldn't get past that AEW dark level, I don't think. Um, you know, his best best case scenario would be Jay Lethal, what Jay Lethal does there. So I enjoy this match a lot. This was one of the first, one of two, the first of two, that's what I was trying to say, DQ finishes for the night. They are scared to have people beat people sometimes. Uh, not that I felt like either of these two needed to take a loss, but sometimes they're afraid of people beating people. But this was a this was a good match, and it was you know Scott Demore came out at the end. I don't know how much 
um, the people cared. But when he starts, you know, there was a lot of cursing on this episode. And Impact does that. They go back and forth with, okay, we're going to get edgy. And you'll get like two or three episodes with cursing and bleeping. And then it goes back to normal for months. And then they go <laughs> they go back to it. So um, there's a lot of cursing on this episode. But calling Bully Ray piece of shit. And but Bully Ray, when he said, but you're the one who hired me, the one who brought me in like that was. That was magical. Because one of the things I say is that the, the real strong point of impact is that a lot of what they do is logical. Uh, you know, you watch some of these other companies and it's like, well, why did you hire the guy? Like, why did you hire nails to come? choke out the undertaker who's your biggest star you know what i mean so that that's an interesting part of the storyline will scott be involved and in, in, in hard to kill here i, I don't i don't know but it, it's good when things are are based in reality and there's logic involved and he says yeah i'm a piece of shit but you you brought me here you know what i mean if he just completely ignored that it would have just been like okay well why why is he here you know it's like those angles, like when EC3 showed up, but he doesn't even work here. Like, well, why is he there? Why are you guys letting him in? You know, same with the honor, no more stuff. But anyway, um, after that, after we got Scott no more throwing a chair, we got the little video of uh, Trey Miguel defacing the X division championship. I'm really interested to see what he does as a heel because I don't think they uh, pushed him to the moon the way they needed to. I really think he should be in the main event picture right now and he's not he's still in the x division so this was the time to uh to flip it around on him or flip it around on us and give us something different with with trey so i'm really um i'm really interested you know he, he spray painted the x division championship because they got new belts right now uh so clearly he just spray painted the old one the belts look exactly the same you know they <laughs> i saw this post where like impact gets new belts i'm like oh awesome maybe they won't be like all red and all this bullshit and um they're just the same belts they're just new uh a match i didn't care for or i just didn't care about it was moose versus bupinder gujar and that's what you know i always say i don't know who my favorite is between moose and rich swan but then after i watched these first two matches i was like you know what i'm always interested in a rich swan match and this match with moose i didn't really care so that kind of told me you know what rich swan is my dude but I still love Moose. Um, I didn't care about the match. Um, two guys who use the spear. Uh, my favorite move in professional wrestling. The spear, the cutter, the DDT. So I, I didn't I didn't, I didn't really care for it. Um, but Moose gets a win. And then you know how a, how a company views a wrestler when you lose and your opponent cuts a promo after the match. That's usually, you know... That's their way of saying you're a jobber. But at the end, you know, they did have him take Moose out. So it's like, okay, we're going to leave him getting the upper hand. So it's like they clearly like the dude. I think they're just trying to figure out how to make it work because no company has ever had, at least to my recollection, as my knowledge, ever had an Indian wrestler that was a baby face. It's a completely new challenge. Uh, you know, to have the strong accent and, and, you know, they even change his music, music up. So I think they're still figuring out what to do with him, but until they figure that out, I, I don't totally care what he does, but yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Like okay, for, for the first time, we're not going to make the Indian do this, this heel that everyone's booing, you know, it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, but uh, he wins the match, and the, and um, hold on here. I'm trying to scroll down here a little bit. He hits the crowd with the "Don't say his name," and Joe Hendry comes out. And we were talking about this myself and TW. Like, well, what the hell's next for Moose? You know, like Moose had really been seeming like he was spinning his wheels for a long time. Like, where is an engaging feud for this dude? He's become such a big star in comparison to most of the people on the roster that like, well, what do you do with them? You know, this is something people are going to have interesting because Joe Hendry comes out and people like Joe Hendry, uh, 
you know, the digital media title means nothing, but at least it's a title feud for Moose to be involved in. Moose might win this thing, you know. I, I could see them hot shotting this belt because it's it's a prop. It's not what they said it was gonna be. It's just it's just a prop. It's just a, you know, they should just change the name of this belt, make it a TV cha- some kind of TV championship, because that's all it really is. But um I really want to see what's next for the two of them because these are two of the more entertaining people on the roster. Right now, the roster has a lot of blandness to it. Not to say it doesn't have talent, but personality-wise, there's a lot of blandness on the roster right now. These are two of the most entertaining guys that they have, creative guys that they have. Moose knocks everything out the park that they give him, and Joe Hendry is real over with people right now. And he's he's very funny. He's he's legitimately funny, and um, I can't wait to see. What is next for the two of these? Gia Miller, Gia Miller interviewed Mike Bailey backstage. This was so bad that, that he should never talk. He just flat out shouldn't. I, I don't I don't know how they get around this. Or I don't know if him talking like this is part of the gimmick. It worked when he was this, uh, when, when it was with Ace Austin and he was acting very, um, what's the word, like naive. It worked for that feud. And then, he did cut some promos later when he's the X-Division champion where he had a little more edge to him. But now he's just right back to, hello, Gia Miller. It's nice to see you today. I will be the X-Division champion. And it's it's unbelievable. It's It just doesn't work. Like, he should not talk. The matches, incredible. This guy um, reminds me of when they brought Desmond Xavier in initially. And he stood out so much in comparison to everyone in the X division for what he could do and being unique. There's no, there's no wrestler in the X division like him. He should not talk though. Absolutely. Absolutely not. Steve Macklin versus Frankie Kazarian. This was a match I cared about because I love Steve Macklin and it was a good match, but it was another DQ finish because they don't want people to beat people. They didn't want Rich Swan to lose earlier because they I think they want to do a program with him and Josh. Not a program, but I could see Impact Plus main event, you know. Um, they're ch- clearly trying to build something with Steve Macklin here and Josh Alexander, so he can't lose either. But they're not going to have Bully Ray lose. They're not going to have Kazarian lose. So you kind of book yourself into a, a corner where you're like, okay, well, everyone's getting every, – everybody's getting di- uh, disqualified in this piece. So I enjoyed it for what it was, but I was just like, why is Frankie Kazarian still wrestling? Like, what, what is he here for at this point? You know, after the pay-per-view, why is he still around? If he's going to do something meaningful, then cool. But if he's just like here to wrestle, I mean, I don't know. But it's cool seeing him. It's, it's, it's cool seeing him around. Like he saw someone had a, this is impact sign and, you know, he's pointing at it. Speaking of which, there was a couple signs and uh, that Bully Ray was addressing, and he told a kid, shut your fat face. I would bet money, I could be wrong, that those were those were plants. There's no way in hell he was calling some kid fat. No way. And some kid, some guy just having to have, having to have, excuse me, just happening. Some guy just happened to have this sign that he, you know, Bully Ray could talk about like there's not a lot of signs in the crowd right now, you know. So I I, I think they were they were definitely props, but who cares, you know? It it, it worked. It helped it helped get um, Bully over in a segment, but but yeah, the the Macklin stuff was cool. Just Macklin, they they start and stop him. You know, he has the this momentum and then he loses it, and you know, like what are you what are you gonna do with this guy? Sasha Steeles, Savannah Evans had something backstage. And this was probably the next step in their partnership, whether they break up or they're teasing tension or whatever. This was the next step because they're both getting into the bland area. Tasha Steeles is not bland. Like Tasha Steeles is great at what she does, but she's not doing anything interesting. And, um, you know, I, that's why I thought they could have pushed out that knockouts tag team title feud, especially with them losing. I think they should have pushed that out as long as freaking possible to give them something to do. 
But when you give us these title matches so quickly, then you're forced to reevaluate that wrestler a lot quicker than you want to. And now you're stuck with what do we do with these two girls? So Savannah Evans is going to wrestle I have Valkyrie next week. Um, Eddie Edwards is doing an interview with Jimmy Miller. I forgot. I know it sounds weird saying this. I forgot Eddie was part of the company. I mean, he was just he's just been such a minor part of the show the last couple of weeks, which is good. Sometimes you got to keep people away. But I also didn't care with what he's doing in PCO with PCO, and I still don't. So uh, when he showed up, I'm like, oh yeah, Eddie. You know, I was looking at his mohawk. I don't know what hairstyle is going to work for him. I never like his hair, but I like this better than the the braids he tried to have for the longest time. Um, but they're still they're still talking about Eddie where Edwards and PCO. I mean, if there's a feud that I just want them to stick a fork in, it's them. Uh, there was a backstage segment with, with the uh, major players, not the major players, um, with uh, Heath and Rhino and Motor City Machine Guns. I thought it was pretty cool. These backstage, backstage segments looked a little better this episode. There wasn't a lot of the pink lights and that nonsense that they do. This particular segment had it a little, but, you know, it, it was okay. Uh, when Rhino started, oh, we're going to rip your fate. You know, I was like, what is this cheese shit? But then I saw the reaction of the Motor City Machine Guns, and <laughs> I was like, this is actually really funny. I thought what really stood out is that Heath and Rhino – Looked like giants next to these two. I screenshotted it with my phone. I meant to tweet it out. I mean, it this stark difference between them. So this is another match that could probably get pushed to the pay-per-view. But we're going to get it on TV for whatever reason. Because the most city machine, machine guns should win. But are they going to take the belts off Heath and Rhino? And if they do the hell's next for them. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they were done here soon. I, I I wouldn't be surprised at all. I think when they were both signed, there was a promise. We're going to put the belts on you. Heath got hurt. Rhino was out. And then they got the belts eventually because they were supposed to. <clears throat> it's, a, it's uneventful. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if they, they were done after this. Mickey James versus Deanna Prazo. This, this was really good. And, I think what I noticed about Mickey James matches is that she really wrestles to the level of competition. She wrestles Deanna Perazzo and she has a Deanna Perazzo type match. But if she wrestles, you know, um, Jenny Jiggle Lips on BTI or something like that, she's going to have a bad match. Uh, I, I just think she wrestle, wrestles to the level of the competition. And it doesn't help when she has has that horrible DDT and the, the Thez press. And I think there's another move that they always look so bad, but if the wrestler isn't like seasoned and, and, and really, really good in the ring, they they're awful. They look awful. So uh, Mickey James is always as good as her opponent. And this was, this was really excellent. This was a great way to end the show as far as a, a main event. In fact, so good about show cat showcasing the females letting a main event a show and and making it natural. They're not like events like Stephanie McMahon years ago when you know, oh, the women are doing this and uh, uh. I mean, Impact just presents it as like, yo, they're equals to the men. You know, so uh, so I could really dig it, but this was this was a good match at the end. Part of me was like, when's Diana done? What the hell could they possibly do with her after this? I don't want her to go anywhere. I really think she's the best. I think she's the best in the world. But what do you do with her at this point? And I know she kind of teased with Chelsea Green, like, hey, you got room for me over there? I wouldn't be surprised if she wasn't out of here. Um, but the match was very good. Mickey wins with like a, a roll-up where she's grabbing the tight. It's not believable. I mean, she had no real leverage. Deanna easily could have kicked out of that. And then she kind of had the heel smirk after it. And I couldn't pick up on the fact that she tried, was it a heel turn or was she just like, I needed to do this to save my career. If that's what it was, I don't think the story was told very well either way. The match was really good, but I didn't get like that sense of desperation with Mickey James. 
in the match to where she's like, I'm going to have to win by any means necessary, like Trey Miguel did when he had his heel turn with Black Taurus. He's like, I can't beat this dude, so I'm going to have to resort to these measures. Like That story was not told here. And then I thought, okay, well, I think she's a heel, but then Jordan Grace comes out, who always looks like a star. And it just seemed like they were back to babyface Mickey James. Like Mickey James won the match and she's doing this and this and putting the hands up and yay, cheer for me. And they had the fans, they showed the fans cheering because they didn't, half of them didn't even know it was a, a cheap finish. So I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused. But they've done a pretty decent job with the Mickey James storyline. I would have liked to have seen her wrestle everyone. Like, for those of you who are watching WWE at this time, and John Cena was the U.S. champion. He did an open challenge every week, and he had big matches with mid-card guys. And I thought they could have done a little more of that. Maybe not so much an open challenge, but really put over your current knockouts, like come have a big match with Mickey James. So she has an Alicia Edwards match. She has a... Um, Ty Valkyrie match and a Rosemary match and uh you know Jessica and um who you know I'm trying to think who else I have a match with everybody like really go all you know it wasn't like she had two matches and she's wrestling for the knockouts championship she had a lot of matches but this was something I think they could have started a lot earlier and had her just just wrestle um to the point that we even forgot that she was going to wrestle Jordan Grace because still in the back of our mind, we're like, she's not going to lose the match because this is just leading up to her wrestling Jordan Grace for the belt. Like we knew that's always what it was going to be. So we're getting that at hard to kill. If, if she actually did a heel turn, I don't think she did. I don't think it is. Like I said, the story was not told really clear, but if it was a heel turn, that means she's going to lose at hard to kill. Because she's not going to go over as a as a heel. She's going <clears> to <throat> maybe be heelish, lose the match, wave goodbye to the crowd, hug her opponent. You, you feel what I'm saying with that? The story I would have liked, but now you can't do it, is if she did this whole baby face last rodeo and then cheat to beat Jordan Grace. And then we just kind of got, I don't know if we got a heel Mickey James, but I mean, that's where I would have liked to have seen it happen for her to cheat, to win at hard to kill. Um, and that, that could have extended their feud, but they already did a cheat to beat Deanna. So is this going to, you know, who knows what they're going to do with this, but, um, but it was good. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I, and I think this match is going to be excellent because she wrestles up to her competition. Like I said, and Jordan Grace cannot have a bad match. She's in that like rich Swan territory, Josh Alexander, some of these dudes where they just have good matches, you know? So we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Um, that's going to do it for me. I wanted to run through this uh, real quick for you guys. Hopefully we're going to do it. We can do a cool factor soon so we can talk about some of the other stuff. Some of the other news you know, and all that, all that good stuff. So thank you for rocking with me, guys. I am your boy BQ. I am out. Peace. <laughs>